All right, my name is Dr. Max Bivaro. Uh, I'm here in two capacities. One is a co-organizer of GOSH, so thank you everyone for coming and being here and being healthy and in place, uh, as well as uh, I direct Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research, which is a feminist decolonial pollution laboratory in northern Canada out of the university uh, in northern Canada. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where I'm from and uh, how that influences my view of open science hardware. I'm going to talk a lot about equity and what that means and especially how it's different from equality. So this is going to be an ethics talk. And then I'm going to talk about how in my lab we try and put equity into our open science hardware, but also everything we do. As a feminist lab, we at every moment we say, how can we make this more equitable? How can we build more equitable tools? How can we involve people into the lab more equitably? How can we order supplies more equitably? How can we take out the trash more equitably? So this is something we talk about a lot. So this is where I'm from. It's in northern Alberta in Canada. It's called the tar sands or the oil sands. It's the largest surface, surface extraction of oil in the world. You can see it from space. And I grew up downwind and downstream of this area. And the community I grew, in, grew up in was very sick, all sorts of different illnesses. And we knew why we were sick. We knew it was from this. Anyone could tell it was from this. But all the data coming to us had to come from the industries who were doing this. And when the government did get involved, um, they appointed a laboratory, and the laboratory became a bottleneck for all information. And the lab was asking questions and doing measurements and doing measurements in places that we didn't agree with. And so this is a very common context by which some people come to open science hardware, justice context, where people need to have sovereignty over their own proof, their own evidence. And this is the context where equity becomes very important because equity is different than equality. Equality means treating everyone exactly the same. Let's say I treat all of you guys exactly the same. I give you an environmental sensor, I give you an environmental sensor, I give you an environmental sensor, but uh, you don't have any electricity. So you can't plug in your Arduino. And uh, you have six kids and your partner is sick from working here. And you have a degree from Cambridge and a really good accent and everyone listens to you. <laughs> so even though I treat them exactly the same, the unevenness that they start with is still the same. So when you treat people equally, sometimes you still replicate the unevenness that they come into science with, or don't come into science with. And that's why equity is so important to us, trying to address this unevenness, trying to address the root of social, political, economic, educational, scientific unevenness. So how would you do that? Or why would you do that? Let's start with why. So, Gosh is Accessible is the first part of the manifesto because it's the basic premise, it's the base of open science hardware. Open usually means the designs, the plans, the protocol is available online, it's open source, it's not patented, it's not private, anyone can download it, except you don't have electricity, you're busy and you're from Cambridge. <laughs> so, just because it's accessible doesn't mean you actually have it open in an equitable sense. So to make it more democratic, to get people in who don't usually get involved in science, to ask the research questions that don't get asked, to produce a type of data that is not recognized as data, right, and actually get different types of knowledge into science, you need to think about equity, equity, equity so that we can actually have different futures for science, and not just a bunch of different people in science how it is already, but actually changing science, and you need equity for that. So how do you do that? So this is what my lab usually studies. Uh, marine microplastics, uh, plastics in the oceans. 93% um, of all plastics in all water um, are smaller than a grain of rice. They're called microplastics. And so you actually need hardware to find them. You can't see them with your eyes. You need some kind of tool. When I say hardware, like Jenny said, I mean everything from any physical thing you use to make systematic knowledge. Pencils, pens, lab equipment, chemicals, regions, electricity. Um, so, there are some open source ways to look for plastics. This is one of them. This is me and my lab assistant in Bermuda using the universal protocol 
um, to look for plastics and sand. Basically, you put a bunch of sand in a bucket, the plastics float out, you dump it into a sieve, you look for the plastics, you count them. It's a citizen science method. The United Nations Environmental Program, uh, NOAA, the European equivalent of NOAA, whose name I don't know, and I apologize. Um, anyway, this is the universal method. Everyone says this is what you do, and so we can all have the same results, and anyone can do this. It's very easy, except this is where I live. I dare you to sieve that. I dare you to walk on that. The reason we took this photo is because I fell into the ocean right there, where that wave is. So yeah. So the universal protocol was to, is not equitable, even though it's very equal. It does not. It can't. You can't use it in the far north. I live in a subarctic province. You can't use it there. And so this is why my lab has to produce its own hardware and its own protocols, because the south, what we call the south which is the middle, uh, doesn't work in the north. So these are the guidelines in my lab for making equitable open hardware. Um, these are just guidelines, they're not the rules. First of all, basic thing, it has to be open source, it, has to, it can't be patented, the designs are online. It has to be usable by citizen scientists. You don't have to need a degree to read our instructions, which means we print all our instructions at a grade eight level which is the average age that people leave school in my province, in rural areas. Doesn't need electricity to work, because my, I live in a capital city in Newfoundland. We don't have dependable electricity. So I have to make all my things no power or low power, and all the tools have to be no power or low power to make it. So hand saws, not drills. Has to cost less than $50 to make. The average person in rural Newfoundland so when we think equity, we think about rural Newfoundlanders who are mostly fishermen, unemployed fishermen, and indigenous communities. And so we make things with them in mind. They are going to have $50 Canadian lying around, but a group of them will have $50. It has to be made of materials you can get in rural Newfoundland. Most communities in rural Newfoundland have one store, the general store. It sells food, clothing, housewares, medical supplies, everything. And so my students, they're from these places, and they go home and they take photographs, that's what's behind this slide, photographs of everything in their general stores. And we only build things from those photographs. Or things you can buy from the Sears catalog, if you're Canadian, you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, you have to be able to repair it, right? So if it, right, your right to repair is very important, and no plastics, because that's our pollutant of choice. So, what does this look like? Not like this. <laughs> This is the scientific standard for if you're looking at plastics on the surface of water. Again, they're very tiny, so this is basically a $3,500 US butterfly net. The plastics go in through the mouth and collect in a very expensive sock. Uh, only two places in North America make this, one in Canada and one in the United States. This is too heavy for me to lift up by myself. You cannot use it off the back of a fishing vessel. This is what my lab made. $12 Canadian, which is only $8 American. It's named baby legs, because those are baby tights for when babies go to church. <laughs> That's what they're really for. That's why you can get them in every rural place in Newfoundland, which is mostly Catholic. Um, a plas and again, some of this is plastic, because it keeps it very cheap. And so when we had to make a decision, we made a decision for equity. How do we keep this rural? Um, just a juice bottle, some fancy pontoons. Uh, stabilizers made out of containers, and you pull this behind. Now this gets very different kind of data than this. This can get you perfect quantitative data. This, because the holes change size when you go very fast, can get you very good qualitative data. So when you're thinking about equity, it has to go all the way down to data. When we work with community groups, they do not care if they can build a really good oceanographic model from their data. They want to know, can they eat here? Is it safe? Will it hurt them? How much? And you can get that data with this. Right? So when you're thinking about equity, it's, just, it's not just about the hardware. It's also the use of the hardware and what data comes out of it. And that's why we've actually built a range of different um, trolls that do the same sort of thing. So this is Coco. She's here. Where are you, Coco? Yeah, over there. She invented this by herself. Well, with my whiteboard sometimes. Um, this is a $500 version. It does the fancy math type data. Baby legs, that one broke. Um, doesn't get used. Right, so, so the same technology, the same hardware for different users, it looks like. So before I leave, just briefly again. When you make data, when you get samples out of these, 
different groups of people will use and understand the data fundamentally differently. I've worked with community groups where I don't think their findings are statistically significant. They don't care. And it's not my job to tell them that they're wrong. It's my job to believe them and support them. And that's what equity and openness looks like. So thank you very much.